Hi, I'm just jumping on here to say that I'm three weeks in now to public health specialty training. Really, really enjoying it. Uh, the induction process so far has been absolutely brilliant. It's been run by uh, a group of SD2, so basically people that are in my exact position just a year down the road. Uh, so that's been really useful to gain kind of insight and little hints and, and tips and um you know, nuggets of information that could serve as a lot of uh, a lot of headaches uh, moving forward. They're doing a, a brilliant job, um, and I'm also loving the uh, the placement as well. So I'm placed at a local authority in the northwest. That presents lots of new challenges. Uh, it's a really good experience. I've been lucky enough to, I suppose, come from a local authority background in public health. So. I've been able to hit the ground running, so to speak, and get involved with, with various pieces of work that perhaps others may not um, have the luxury of doing. And I know that for a fact, because particularly the medics as well, the, the people that have come from a medical background, um, I think the first few weeks for them in a local authority placement is simply trying to build that understanding of, of, of what a local authority is, how it functions, what its statutory duties are, the political landscape around it, how public health fits into local authority, so on and so forth. And obviously that's different between each council, but um, there are a lot of similarities. So that's that's uh, that's been helpful for me. But um, anyway, I'm blabbing on now. I, the reason I want to do this video is it's something I mentioned in my first kind of reflection, first vlog, if you like. And that is um, imposter syndrome, essentially. I should add a disclaimer that I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, an expert in imposter syndrome or psychology. Uh, you know, I'm not a trained psychologist, psychotherapist. I've not got a degree in psychology or anything like that. So all the information that... <coughs> excuse me, that all the information that I um, share today, call it advice if you, if you want, um, it's based on my observations, it's based on my experience, and it's based on, on what I found kind of works for me um, when, when suffering from um, imposter syndrome. So, I mean, for me, imposter syndrome is something that I've experienced um, throughout my career, I suppose, so far. Um, and you know, it's it's a case of trying to eliminate the self, the negative self-talk that occurs when you know I'm feeling like an imposter. Uh, so that's kind of the, 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 the I guess the reason of the reason for doing this video, I suppose. So what is imposter syndrome? <laughs> I'm not going to waste time giving you a, a clinical definition of that because you could go onto Google and, and type out that question and get an answer within five seconds and you'll get, you know, really probably quite a clear definition of that. So um, as opposed for me, imposter syndrome is is that feeling of, of self-doubt that you are kind of completely inadequate among the company that you find yourself in. Um, you're not as skilled, you're not as talented. You're not as knowledgeable. Everyone else is is smarter. They speak more fluently. They articulate things better. Um, you're on there because somehow the stars aligned. You got lucky. Um, you don't really deserve to be there. That's kind of the the, the emotions and thoughts and feelings that that I certainly get um, with imposter syndrome. I think it's important to realise that with imposter syndrome, it is entirely normal. You know, chances are you're not the only person that that feels that way. Well, I know for a fact you're not the only person that, that, that has imposter syndrome. It is very, very common. But, you know, it's kind of expected, isn't it? You know, you in any job, but, but certainly public health and, and certainly public health specialty training program, you're in a new environment, you're with new colleagues, you're with new people, you're working in a perhaps a slightly different field, particularly if you come from a medical background and you've not got that direct public health experience. I mean, using public health specialty 
using the training program as, as an example, of course imposter syndrome is a normal thing. You've you've literally gone through this, again from my opinion, this grueling recruitment process that, that's, that's difficult and that recruitment process is designed to kind of pick the best of the best and if you've got a small amount of humility about you, you simply refuse to accept that, that you could be included in, in that small cohort of people that that have been successful in that uh, recruitment process. You, you know, you think you're there just because you got lucky. Um, you then go on and have induction sessions where you meet the rest of your regional cohort. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's doctors there, there's people with um, various medical backgrounds, there's epidemiologists with 15 years experience in the field, there's public health analysts who are absolute gurus on anything and everything to do with st statistics and, and public health data. There's public health professionals in there that are highly skilled, highly experienced, more so than you. And you think, oh, wow, these people are extraordinary. What the fuck am I doing in this room? Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I think one thing to note is that it's probably much better to have an experience imposter syndrome than the opposite of that which is the Dunning-Kruger effect. And that's essentially where you massively overestimate your competencies, your skills, your knowledge, and it almost kind of blinds you to what other people think and, 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 and the work that you're doing. Uh, you know, that's something that you definitely don't want, uh, I would say. Now, in terms of managing imposter syndrome, I, don't know, I guess, <clears throat> Sorry, getting notifications. I guess before I go on to kind of things that you that you could potentially have, things that I do that potentially you could do to, to manage imposter syndrome, I think it's worth mentioning that it's actually not it, it's a good place to be when you look at the bigger picture. You know, if, if you're completely comfortable in any role in your career and if you've got ambition, then then you're in the wrong place. If you're too comfortable for too long, you are treading water, almost. You know, life doesn't go on forever, and careers don't go on forever. And so if you don't have, I, I mean, I'm going around in circles with this, but if you don't have imposter syndrome, you're probably not pushing yourself as far as you should be, if that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. But anyway, yeah, de dealing with imposter syndrome. There's a few things that I do. Um, I'll reiterate that the first thing I do is realise that it is absolutely normal and the chances are that there are other people in the room um, that also have um, experienced imposter syndrome, that might be experiencing imposter syndrome there and then. It's also a testament to you. <clears throat> it basically means that you're not an arrogant arsehole who thinks they're better than everyone else. You know, that again, that's 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 a good thing. Secondly, um, understand that those people that you look up to, right, they might be in the room, that they might not be, but let's you know use public health as an example. We've got people like Chris Whitty, we've got people like Sir Michael Marmot, we've got Patrick Valence and, and, and all the rest of them whoever your, your role models are, and you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be public health, anyone, anyone, they will very likely have experienced imposter syndrome at various points throughout their careers, possibly still to this day. So, you know, they're, they're at the top, aren't they? Let's be honest. I reckon when Chris Whitty did those press conferences, or the first press conference that he did with, with Boris and, and whatnot, He'll have probably had some, well, I'd imagine he'd have some form of imposter syndrome. I might be wrong, but chances are, you know, he's quite nervous. He was out of his comfort zone, for sure. Um, so if they've experienced it, don't feel bad that, that you're experiencing it. You know, it's, it's, it's okay. Another thing I do is try to think more broadly and, and and shift the situation. Bear with me on this. So for me, if I'm in a room of people and I've got imposter syndrome, I will picture 
everyone in that room and imagine everyone in that room in my comfort zone in my environment where I feel incredibly comfortable and almost am able to function autonomously and for me that is um, a gym environment under a bench press doing bench press or under a squat rack doing squats or some, something like that I've done that for you know more than half of my life it's something I do with my eyes well, I don't do with my eyes closed I could do with my eyes closed it's it's an environment where I am completely comfortable and I would imagine and back myself to be the best or one of the best at least in that room at doing XYZ exercise, if that makes sense. So I picture everyone in that room coming along with me with the gym gear on. And in my mind as well, I, I imagine that this is a foreign environment for them that they've never step foot in a gym and for some people that's completely false because they're very active and very um, you know into the fitness and whatnot but for others it, it would be a completely foreign uh, environment um, and that kind of refocuses the situation and almost flips it on its head because in my mind we then move to a, a situation and an environment and, and uh, a task which is something that I'm the best at and everyone else is the imposter somewhat and that's not me having that Dunning-Kruger syndrome uh, you know not by a long way trust me um, but that's how I kind of give myself confidence and think oh well actually there is something that I'm probably the best in the room at um, and for other people it's probably not the gym and this is the beauty of it it can be absolutely anything it could be painting it could be dancing, it could be singing, it could be writing poetry, it could be chess, it could be knowledge about something quite niche and quite specific if you've got a passion in that area. Um, classic cars, World War II, uh, Royal Family, um, how to make coffee, uh, you know, how to brew coffee, I, I don't know. It, it could be absolutely anything. The chances are, if, if, if you've done something or if you have a hobby and a passion that you've um, indulged in for decades potentially that other people haven't you are the expert in that um, within that room um, and other people will likely look, likely know next to nothing um, about that um, but also you are in that room and again this is kind of me talking to myself you're in that room sitting with those extraordinary people because you absolutely deserve to be. The process of getting onto the public health specialty training program is extremely rigorous and it's kind of structured in a way that makes it as fair as it, as it possibly can be. It puts people on a level playing field regardless of whether you're from a medical or a public health background or potentially something a little bit different but to get onto this you did better than 90 percent probably 92 percent so you're in that kind of top eight percent i'd imagine of all the people who applied to be on that program this year you are there because you have something that nobody else in that room has um, or even across the entire program has you know you might know what you might not know what that that thing is and that's fine that's probably what the, the, the five years of the program is, is set out to kind of help you do it, it's it's realizing okay what are my strengths or what area of public health do i want to really specialize in what do i want to where do i want to be where do i want to work in five years time do i want to be a consultant in a local authority in the nhs do i want to work for public services police or do i want to go into research could be absolutely anything I think the program will bring that out of you I'm still exploring kind of the reason that I've got onto the program um, and that's not me just saying that you know I I said numerous times to numerous people that I think I got quite lucky to, to get on to the program and if anyone was to ask me oh you know what's your best advice you know I'll give that advice but I will say you need a little bit of luck as well you probably need the interview questions to fall your way a little bit. You probably need some of the kind of Watson Glazer questions and the situational judgment test to 
fall your way a little bit. Um, but again, that's probably me, the inner me, the inner imposter, saying that. Um, but I don't want to go around in circles and, and just blab on about this. Um, I'm in a regional cohort of 12, I think it's, I think it's 14. 14 people and they are um, really nice people as well um, but amazing people you know smarter than me brighter than me more experienced than me but again there's something about me that has meant that i get to be among them and deserve to be among them you know so here we are you know hopefully people can relate to that um, if you were to google how to um, how to overcome imposter syndrome or, or something like that you probably get uh, some quite useful information it might tell you to go see a psychologist and I, I think for 99% of people I don't think that, that that would be the case I think you know do, doing just kind of reflecting on why you have imposter syndrome whilst realizing that it is normal that other people do have it that it is something that tends to fade as well i don't think i mentioned that but i think it, it, it tends to fade over time as you believe in yourself a little bit more you get a bit of feedback a bit of positive feedback about the work that you're doing or from your peers um and you start to kind of think oh no i've, I've got this but then over time and over the years when you start to feel very very comfortable that's probably when you you're almost ready for either a new piece of work in a different slightly different field or potentially a new a new job um, as well. So you can use it as kind of an indicator throughout your career. Um, not to say that you should go chasing imposter syndrome and anxiety and all, all the little things that come with it. Um, but yeah, hopefully you get my drift with that. Um, recruitment for this year for the public health specialty training program will open in November. I believe there are various regional webinars that are either being cast on the web over the next few weeks or months um, they are worthwhile viewing and obviously well not obviously but you might not be able to attend all of them so for instance there's a Yorkshire and Humber one there'll be a like East Midlands one there might be one in London there might be a Northwest one they're all recorded usually and you can find them on the Deanery website and you can actually watch the previous year's um webinars as well they're usually quite long like two hours and um, some of them are kind of time stamped on, on, on youtube so you can flip to kind of the bits that, that you might find um more useful uh, more interesting or, or more relevant but i'd highly recommend that if you're considering applying for public health specialty training this year that your first port of call would be to watch as many of those webinars as you can attend the live webinars um, if possible because there's usually an opportunity to ask questions so you might have questions that, that, that you want to ask um, that, that can get uh, an answer as for the last stages of the application process i'm going to try help um, if and however i can with the process it, it's always been reiterated that there has to be a level of confidentiality that's maintained throughout the process to, to keep it fair, um, which I, th I think is, is um, something to respect, definitely. So I will have to check in terms of what type of information I can provide. So I don't think, for instance, I could give you or, or share the interview questions that, that I got asked last year. Um, well, actually it was early this year, uh, but I'll, I'll check that. Um, I can certainly uh, offer tips and advice on the assessment centre experience in terms of the, like the Watson Glazer test, the RANRA numerical reasoning and the situational judgment test as well. I can give you my two cents on, on those, um, which arguably is probably the, the, the I'm going to say the hardest part or the most unnatural part, I think for me. Um, and again, that's that's personal opinion. It might be different for other people. Um, but yeah, also, I mean, I know I'm kind of talking to like potentially nobody here. But if anyone has any questions, you know, you can 
you can email me, you probably don't have my email address. Um, but you can tweet me, I think my Twitter handle is on the banner of my YouTube page. I, I, I don't think you can, I think you can message as well through YouTube. So, um, you know, if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to kind of well, answer them. Or if you've got any things that you'd like covered about the training program, uh, please feel free. Like I said in my last, I think I said it in my last video, I do intend to like do videos random as they are across ST1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Um, no doubt I learn a lot along the way. But um, anyway, I hope everyone has a good weekend because it is Saturday when I'm recording this. Um, Saturday the 20th of August. Wow. Time flies. Okay. Right. See you later. See you later, guys. Bye.